Well, welcome uh, to this very short tutorial. I'm going to try and keep it to under 10 minutes to look at the basics of sourcing a particle simulation, which is one of the things that you need to understand to be able to run a particle simulation. Uh, I'm going to do a series of short tutorials, I hope, building up to uh, a description of a, of a complex system. But let's start with sourcing. So I've got a, a basic sphere here. And in order to set up a particle system, I just need to click on the source particles tool here in the shelf. And I do that and we can see uh, that we have a particle system that's kind of set up by default. To make this a bit more interesting, I'm going to add a rigid body ground plane here. So on the rigid body tab, control click that. And my sphere is above the ground plane, so we'll see that those particles are bouncing and uh, bouncing off the ground the floor there. Now if you can't see your particles very easily, you can do a little trick uh, with Houdini 14, which is uh, to bring up the display options. And here on the Geometry tab, you can choose the point size for displaying points. So I'm going to put this up to, say, 7. And you can see now that our points, our particles, are, are now much bigger and much easier to see. So let's see uh, what the Shelf tool has set up and we can see that we started off with just this node the source so these uh, and this node is the ground plane that I added so these are the two nodes that the shelf tool added the autodot network contains our simulation and all the source particles is doing is bringing the particles out of that simulation into a node so that they can be rendered inside the particle simulation inside the autodot network rather uh, let me just hit L to lay this out. We've got quite a complex set of nodes here. These three nodes are just the ground plane. They're setting up the ground plane, which is going to be a collision object for those particles. Uh, this is the thing that is creating our particle simulation. And then down at the bottom here, we've got gravity, which is why the particles are falling down. And then the output node, which marks the end of the simulation or the final node in the simulation. So we're mainly going to be interested in this node here, the source node, uh, which if we bring up a parameters pane, we can see is a pop source node. But a second on the pop object. So the pop object is the thing that actually contains your particle geometry. And it's here that you can set things like uh, the way collisions are calculated and also some of the physical properties. The most useful of these is probably the bounce property. So let me just demonstrate how that works. Uh, so let's turn the bounce back up to 1. And we can see that there's bounce like so. Uh, and I can take the bounce down to something else. And we'll see that they're less bouncy. So these physical properties can be adjusted to uh, adapt the way that the collisions work. As I said, the main thing we're going to look at here is the source node. So let's enlarge this. It has four tabs. Uh, we're only going to be dealing with the first three today. And the first thing I should talk about perhaps is the emission type. So the emission type has a number of different variants. The moment it's set to scatter onto surfaces. So this is scattering randomly across the surface a number of points at every frame. And the locations of those points will change with every frame so that it produces a nice random flow of particles. An alternative here is to use all points. Uh, and what that means is that at every frame, there's a, let me just, what I'll do in order to see, so you can see this better, is I'll turn off the velocity. Actually, let's use inherited velocity, turn it down to zero. And now we can see that, and we'll turn off gravity as well. We can see that at every frame, all it's doing is putting a particle at each of the points of the incoming sphere geometry. A final, uh, we're not going to use all geometry, that's a rather complex option. The final thing is points. This just uses the points in the geometry, but it doesn't use all of them. It just randomly selects the right number of points depending on how many particles you're emitting at each frame, like so. Uh, 
So further down here, uh, we just have some parameters which point to the source geometry. You can use a subgroup of the source geometry if you want to limit uh, the area that is emitting particles. On the next tab, uh, we have the parameters that control the birth rate of the particles. There are two basic ways in which particles can be emitted, impulse activation and constant activation. Impulse activation means that at every frame, or, or rather every sub-step of the simulation, a certain number of particles equal to the impulse count will be emitted from the surface. Constant activation uh, emits particles, a certain number of particles, every second. So it doesn't depend on your frame rate or the number of simulation steps. So in general you'll want to use uh, constant birth rate or constant activation. The default is it's set up so that the impulse count is zero, so you're just getting a constant uh, stream of particles. One thing that is useful for impulse activation is to emit just particles at the first frame of the simulation. So if I was to turn off uh, the constant activation and then, let's say, emit 100 particles, and I would change this to dollar ff equals 1, which will be true only at the first frame. So you can see it's true now. So when we move on to the second frame, this is no longer true and our emission has stopped. So we can see it just creates those particles. So let's revert back to the standard. One variant of sourcing is to use a volume uh, as the source. And for this to work, you need to say scatter onto surfaces. So with this set to scatter onto surfaces, I've actually got in my source node here, a number of different things set up. And if I change this switch, uh, we get a volume rather than the surface. And we can probably see that instead of those points being scattered onto the surface, they're now being scattered throughout the volume. So the parameters down here, uh, we're just going to look at later. Life expectancy and life variance I will cover now. The life expectancy is the number of seconds which the particle will live for before it dies, and then obviously the variance will add some variation to that randomly. The seed is the seed for the emission of the particles. If I change the seed, we can see that the, the distribution of those particles will change. So let me change back to my original sphere. And one of the most useful things to do with a particle simulation is to set the initial velocity of your particles. And there are a couple of ways to do this. Um, one is here on the source node, on the attribute section. Uh, we can use inherited velocity, add to inherited velocity, or set initial velocity. Let me add to inherited velocity. Now, in fact, let me turn up that to, to one. In fact, there is no uh, velocity on this object. Uh, I'll show you in a minute how to put velocity onto the object. So the inherited velocity is going to be zero, but you can see uh, that the set velocity is zero also, but the variance is set to one. So what this is going to do is it's going to set the velocity of each particle to the sum of the inherited velocity, whatever is here, and then a random direction of size one, one, one. And we can see that this sort of spreads them out a little bit, sort of creates a sort of fan. If I turn off gravity, that's that's easier to see. So let's do that. And we can see they all go out in, in all directions. Obviously, it might be useful to uh, set a, a velocity to start with. So we can turn the variance down to 1, put this, say, 4 in the upward direction. And we can see that our particles now head upwards. Gravity is turned off, so they're not they're not falling down. I can probably turn gravity back on, and we can see they eventually fall back down. Now you'll see they're they're flowing in absolutely straight line now because there is no variance. But if I were to increase the variance a bit, then we'll see that that it has a more fountain-like shape. Let me revert this back. Now, 
setting the velocity here is is obviously very useful uh, but you might also want to create some very complex variation in velocity uh, which depends on the tributes that are on your object and you can do that uh, using inherited velocity so I've got a, an example set up here uh, which I think is number two and if we look in here I've just got a very basic example here but you could use any kind of calculation. I've got a point node here and I've turned this to add velocity. This is on the particle tab of the point node and I've just given it some velocity upwards like we had before. So this is just duplicating what you could do in the source node but it, what it's actually doing is putting, if we have a look at our geometry spreadsheet, it's putting these three attributes, this velocity vector, onto each point in our geometry and then if we go into our auto.network because we've got inherited add to inherited velocity so it's inheriting the velocity we can see uh, that this is creating particles with a upward velocity. If I turn that down to zero then the particles are just going to fall straight down and obviously we could increase the velocity we could make this five for example uh, and then they'll be going up even even more strongly than they were before and eventually coming back down. Going back to the source node I, I just want to point out uh, that there are two ways, at least two ways, that you can produce this velocity attribute. You could do it here in a in a point stop or you could use an attribute wrangle and I've set one up here to, to show how that's done. So the vector attribute, attribute v and we set it to 0, 3, 0. Now obviously in VEX you could have a much more complex formula for creating those velocity attributes, changing the direction according to the shape of geometry or whatever, uh, so that can be a much more useful way of setting up your velocity attribute if you want something complicated. Well the inheriting uh, this attribute, this velocity attribute, is one way in which particles inherit attributes but you can also inherit other attributes, so anything you like, any any attribute on this geometry point, on these geometry points, can be inherited by your particles. So let's have a look at this version. So I need to change my switch round to point at this. And let's turn that up to three. So what this has done, uh, all I'm doing here is I'm taking the sphere grouping half of the primitives, colouring one half red and the other half green. And as you can see already, uh, these particles are inheriting the colour that comes from those primitives. And that happens because here in the source node, uh, we've got this inherited tributes set to star, which means inherit absolutely everything. I could just inherit the point position like so and you can see that the, the particles revert back to being colorless. So we'll now get into some slightly more sophisticated uh, aspects of using this and this is where we have a rapidly moving source. So again let me Select this switch, turn it up to four, and we can see, um, let me just hide other objects for a second. We can see that if we play this, this is rapidly moving back and forth, like so. And this is going to cause a problem initially for our simulation, uh, which we can probably see more more easily if we zoom out. And as you can see, it, it's sort of producing these, let me, let me change this actually. Um, and in fact, this gives me an opportunity to demonstrate another aspect of, of the POP solver. Um, at the moment, we've got it so that our particles are, are bouncing whenever they moving, they keep moving whenever they hit that ground plane. And in fact, we might not want that to happen. We may just want them to stop as soon as they hit the ground plane. Uh, 
And there are various ways you can achieve that, but one of them is here on the Collision tab of the Pop Solver. And on the Collision tab of the Pop Solver, we can say Add Hit Attributes, and that enables this box response. And the response we can set to stop. And so what this will do is these particles will just stop. And the thing that we can see quite clearly now that those are stopped is that these are not sort of flowing continuously out of the out of the sphere. We're getting these sort of piles instead of a what we might expect, which would be a sort of continuous line of of particles. Well the reason for that is on the source node uh, where on the birth tab uh, we have this parameter called interpolate source and what that is going to do is going to allow the solver to work out fractional positions of this between frames and compensate for the fact that it's moving very fast. So if I turn this on to say forward uh, then we can see uh, that it's now behaving as we might expect. If you look carefully, you can see that it's going, the, the, the width of that deposit of, of particles is much wider than the movement of the source. And the reason for that is that I've still got set up here my inherit velocity attribute set to 5. Let me set it to point 0.1. And now we should see that it's much less. And that's because the particles are inheriting that very fast velocity of the source. That doesn't happen automatically. Uh, that only happens if there's a V or velocity attribute set up on the source. So how have I managed to get it to recognize uh, that velocity? Well, if we look at uh, where I've set up the moving sphere, <coughs> we can see that there are two things. First of all, there is a transform, and I've used motion effects to create that movement, but we, we won't go into that now. And the second uh, SOP I've got here is a trail SOP. And a trail SOP is a way of, of doing things with moving points. Uh, and one of the options is to compute velocity. And that's what I'm doing. So this is creating, if we have a look now at the geometry spreadsheet, this is creating velocity attributes for our points on our sphere. Now, this only works because we are animating our sphere here at the geometry level. If we had our animations up here on the source level, uh, on the scene level rather, uh, for example by animating these parameters, we'd find that our trail stop wouldn't record any velocity. And there is a way around that I, to do with importing the geometry into a second geometry node. But for the moment, uh, if you want to have a moving source that's going to be recognized in your POP network, better to, to do the animation here at the geometry level, and then you can use the trail saw. We looked at uh, one way of creating attributes, uh, that the color attributes, so that it was inherited from point attributes here on the source. There is another way uh, to achieve the same thing. Let me revert my switch node back to the first position. So this is just the plane geometry, doesn't have any attributes and then go into our auto.network. And we can see uh, that on the birth node here, there is, on the birth tab rather, there is this parameter just born group. So let me put something in there. And this is going to give me a group for just those particles which have been born this, this second, this frame. And that allows me to do for example a pop color so put a pop color down it's purple that's fine and I can select the group here and I'm going to use the group birth and that means that the particles that are just born are going to be set to purple now you could say well why don't I just apply that to all of the particles at every frame and indeed that would work in this case but if we had some later nodes here that say for particles that were over a certain age colored them differently then we would risk uh, 
the two nodes conflicting with each other and we're not getting the result that we expect. So it's better if you're setting up initial attributes for some particles that have been emitted to do so using a, a group like this, using the birth group. And as before, there's an equivalent to the attribute wrangle that we saw in the SOP here. There's a pop wrangle. So I could just say v at cd equals set one zero zero, which will set uh, the particles to red. At least it should. Let's see whether that's worked. And yes, we can see that those are those are now all red. Good. The final tab here, or the next to final tab, is the stream, and this sets up a stream name for our particles. And if we middle click here, um, we, we probably can't see this on the video. Let me uh, perhaps swap these around, and then we can middle click. So we can see, I think, that there is a stream source source with 209 particles. I fear that's still off the video. Let me just put it up there. There. And streams are rather like groups, uh, but they're a special way of handling particles. And I'm going to, in the next uh, lesson, go into a bit more detail on streams. So I hope that's been useful.